is an engineer by training from Politecnico Torino. She did a PhD in energy economics. And at that time, she was already working on energy system integration. She visited Singalan. She visited Durham. And I think this is the connection with Toraj, uh, because he used to be at Durham, right, university, one of his uh, former really affiliations. Works. Yeah. <laughs> He's currently director of the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. He's also an energy economist with an impressive list of publications. And some of his work is on, you know, applying econometrics. And this is the connection to Anne, because Anne, by training, is an econometrician, a statistician, um, then has a very uh, extensive experience in policy at the European Commission, and now is sharing her expertise uh, with the students at Sciences Po, uh, teaching there. And she's also a regular, because she's coming back to FSR Insights as a discussant. So I'm very happy uh, to see her again in this first season of online events. So, as always, we have a chat box, we have a Q&A box. Do not hesitate to leave your questions and comments there. Um, and we'll kick off because Gulnush will make a presentation leading to a poll with the audience, then leading to a discussion with our panelists. Um, go ahead, Gulnush. Thank you, Leo, for this very interesting and nice introduction. So uh, today, uh, of course, it's going to be the topic is uh, the energy system integration, which is a very interesting topic, not only in the EU, but also, for example, in North America. And uh, the presentation of today or the research that uh, is going on at the FSR and we are going to present today is basically on defining the energy system integration and conceptualization of this, uh, uh, defini of, of this paradigm, which we think that is necessary because uh, there is uh, not a def uh, common definition of energy system integration, not in the literature, not in the policy paper, that uh, has been already out by the commission, for example, last year. So what we, we do here is to start, uh, first of all, to answer this question, why do we need energy system integration? Uh, well, the answer goes back to the fact that the policies that uh, we have to reach a carbon neutrality by 2050, including electrification and decarbonization, will inevitably lead to three outcomes. First of all, is the increasing integration of renewable energy resources, which are intermittent in nature. Then it is the increasing attention that is being uh, paid to uh, gases and liquid fuels that are being produced using electricity and, for example, hydrogen and ethanol. And the third one is the increasing penetration of e-mobility. All of these mean that uh, we are going to need to have more flexibility and balancing options, first of all, for power system. And then we are going to need, we are going to, uh, uh, we will need actually to coordinate better the power sector with not only other energy sectors, but also with other sectors of the economy, such as transportation. So energy system integration uh, is said to be able to provide uh, solutions to these challenges and problems. And we are going to see uh, if, if there is a, 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 the definition actually uh, follows this kind of uh, claim or this kind of objective, let's say. So what is energy system integration? Uh, in the uh, strategy, the proposal for a strategy that was out last June by Commission, they defined energy system integration as a holistic view of the whole energy system and using the synergies that exist between different energy uh, sectors to actually reach the net, uh, carbon neutrality by 2015 in a more cost effective way. When you take a look at the literature, more or less the same definition is there, but uh, there is also a huge discrepancy and uh, you see a, a wide uh, division of the literature into uh, defining energy system integration uh, as sector coupling and uh, considering it to be the same thing or in another, in another uh, let's say branch of research, they consider sector coupling be being one of the main uh, components or elements of uh, an integrated energy system or a multi-energy system. So yeah, there, there is no the uh, 
let, let's say the summary is that there is no common definition of energy system degradation currently in the literature. And we think it is important uh, to have this common definition uh, to actually being able to implement the integration of the systems in, a right, in the right way. So to define ESI, uh, we try to, first of all, uh, raise some questions, a couple of questions. The first question is, uh, what is it going to integrate with what? Are we talking about sectors, for example, industrial sectors with energy sectors as it is being implied by the uh, economic literature, or are we talking about integrating vectors such as gas, heat, electricity, uh, heat, electricity, and uh, later on hydrogen, etc., uh, which is the, the the branch of literature in the economic uh, the economic literature, basically. Or uh, we can actually define models uh, to be integrated with each other, which is something that we are going to talk about, and it is being taken from the institutional economy, economics literature. So uh, why models uh, and why, why we want to divide energy systems into models, basically, the energy system is changing. The first change is uh, moving away from the dominance of electricity and natural gas as vectors and uh, having, for example, hydrogen as a fuel, as a vector. Uh, and the second one, the second change that is uh, very important is the fact that we are going to have a more and more modular energy system. And what do we mean by model? Uh, again, I will uh, go back to the uh, institutional economics uh, literature and uh, the, where they define a model as a component or a step in production that can be carried out separately, autonomously, from other steps or components. Uh, but they can also interact with other steps or other components. So uh, we think that this is the future that the energy system is moving towards. Why, for example, now we already see that uh, we have these small scale players and the end use segments, uh, such as, for example, prosumers that can uh, that have these behind the meter behaviors. Uh, for example, they can install uh, solar panels and uh, uh, they, they can have search systems and be independent of the grid and behave uh, autonomously or even in the larger scale this was the small scale even the, in the larger scale we can have those generators that have uh, that use wind power to generate electricity and then they can also install electrolyzers to uh, convert their excess electricity to for example hydrogen so you see we, but but they can also interact with uh, for example tsos in the electricity sector or they can interact with other components and uh, 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 players in the market, not only in the electric sector, but also, for example, in the hydrogen sector, it, it comes to life later on. Uh, so we will have both a small scale and larger scale models in the future of the energy system. Uh, and to understand how we can actually integrate into models, in, in, integrate these models into the energy system, we have to understand how they would function. So uh, we, we have to ask these questions. Uh, if the, does this single model function individually or would it uh, interact with other models? And the second question is that, uh, the, is this function in only one sector function or uh, interaction actually in, in only one sector? or in different sectors autonomously, or uh, this function is at the crossroad of the different sectors. So these are the questions that uh, we need to ask and we need to clarify uh, in order to be able to integrate these models into the energy system or integrate them with each other. Then we uh, understand the functions, the models, and uh, these questions that we already asked, we can go and ask the second question uh, in order to define energy system integration. And the second question uh, is regarding the dimensions of integration. So if we want to integrate a model into the energy system, uh, into the energy system, or we want to integrate models with each other, uh, is this integration going to be technological integration or are we talking about business models integrating with each other or the regulation or the market? Uh, what are we talking about in terms of the dimension of the integration? So 
this is where I want to ask you also this question, and I want to take a moment. Uh, I want you to take a moment and uh, answer uh, the following question. Which of uh, the following do you think would be the most important for energy system integration? We should pay more attention to the technologies and infrastructure, or we should pay more attention to market design and business models, or it should be regulation and policy. The poll is up. Okay. So, uh, very interesting because we, we see that uh, uh, almost the uh, regulation and policy uh, is the same as technologies and infrastructure 44%, 12 people, and uh, uh, around 37% uh, for technology. So, it is uh, interesting, and I will reflect on this, but uh, what, what we need to know is that, uh, of course, technologies and infrastructure, uh, market design and business, and also regulation and policy, they are important. Uh, but what we need to understand is that, uh, okay, so when we go to the literature, we see that, okay, uh, the most of attention is actually on the technology side of integration. So they pay attention more to the enabling technologies for uh, system integration, for example, power to gas, power to heat, power to X in general. Uh, and less attention is being uh, uh, directed toward market design or for example, regulation, or even when we talk about, when they talk about business models, they uh, specifically consider business models and new business models for power to X without considering this uh, in the context of uh, sector coupling or even sector integration. So uh, you already answered that policy and regulation makes uh, more sense and is more important than the technology, but you see that the literature is uh, focusing more on enabling technologies. So what we considered is basically this. So we, so we considered that the literature is focusing on enabling technologies, but we said that, okay, no, en enabling technologies uh, besides enabling infrastructures is only, uh, are only parts of what we have to consider as dimensions of uh, integration. So uh, what else did we consider? These are the following. The new market design uh, and uh, the new market rules uh, are also important. Uh, business models, regulation, and governance. So in other words, when we want to talk about integration of a model or a function into the energy system, we should not only talk about technologies, but we have to also consider whether this uh, integration happens at, at, at these other dimensions. And uh, when we uh, also, when we understand the function, first the function of the model, then we understand at which dimension, at which each dimension the integration will happen, we can talk about the steps of integrating a model or the steps of energy system integration. What are these steps? First of all, of course, um, the infrastructure should be rolled out, the technology should be rolled out. Uh, which will uh, maybe, which would maybe the result in creation of a new model, for example, or uh, the uh, increase of the usage of uh, existing models. Then we have to define uh, the model with specific dimensions. For example, we have to define for each model uh, what would be the dimension at which they would integrate with other models or with the energy system as a whole. Is it the market? or is it the business model or regulation, et cetera. After defining this model a specific dimension, so for after defining dimensions for each of the models, we have to uh, understand whether these uh, di model specific dimensions are compatible with what is going on in the general framework. And uh, after that, after these uh, three these three steps, after understanding whether uh, the, these modular dimensions are actually compatible with the general frame or not, we can ask or raise this question of identifying the barriers uh, to uh, module integration. 
so you see the process of uh, uh, integration and the, the long process to reach to this point that uh, why uh, uh, do we need to, for example, uh, um, uh, identify the barriers and how we need to identify the barriers. So it's a long process to reach here. And um, uh, these barriers can belong to a uh, economic categorization or for example, regulatory and policy barriers. But we feel that as we did it here, as we uh, try to understand analytically uh, what is energy system integration for barriers we have to also to follow the same uh, process so uh, if we want to identify the barriers for energy system integration we have to uh, know what is uh, the uh, which model is going to integrate and uh, uh, what would be the function of the module and then what would be the dimensions at which uh, the integration would happen and then after that, for each of these models, for each of those uh, dimensions, we can uh, understand and on, uh, analytically study the barriers to model integration, which is the next step for us. Uh, this was this, and I think, Lo, you can take the floor. Thank you, Golnush. I think we can also stop sharing the slide. Yeah, great. So thank you for that intro, right? A very analytical approach um, to the topic. Um, so I'm just looking who will go first. Anna, you're already unmuted, so I can give you the floor first. So our two discussants will give their view. Maybe how would you have responded to the poll and any other comments you want to give on Gold News presentation? Let me also already take from the chat box two comments. You can maybe react to them. So we have Debra that is saying uh, all dimensions are crucial, important, but policy and regulation drives the rest. And then Bruce seems to be thinking a bit different because Bruce says, no, 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 technology is often more advanced than regulatory policy. So technology is maybe driving the regulation and the policy. So <laughs> Anna, please. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everybody who listens to us. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I mean, I've, I first, I want to say something. I noticed that in the title, you refer to energy systems integration, while the European Commission always talks about energy system integration. And, and to me, that's the whole point that we still have parallel energy systems that we want to integrate in one energy system that is sort of planned and operated as a whole single system, which is indeed quite a challenge and has many dimensions as the title rightly right, says. Now, as Goldnus said, the starting point is of course the overarching objective of the, the, the Green Deal to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And there's no agreement to put this in the EU uh, legislation, in the EU climate law, together with a new intermediate uh, target of 55% of greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. That gives good visibility. But I mean, it's quite a jump from the NDC that the EU submitted to Paris six years ago, which was 40% reduction. And to me, that is why the Green Deal puts the decarbonization efforts on a much broader range of activities and requires to take account of the, the full energy supply chain and of the use of all the resources, including water, food, uh, raw materials, etc. cetera, you know, evaluations. Now, this increase in, in, in climate ambition also, also comes with additional investment needs I mean, if you look at the impact assessment of the, the climate law, it estimates that in the coming decades, we will need to invest 350 billion more per year than we did in the previous decade. And that's an increase of about 90 billion per year compared to the investment needed to achieve the previous, the old 2030 climate uh, and, and energy targets of 40%, 32 and 32 and a half. So that's really quite, quite a additional effort. And it's easy to see why we will never make it if we are not super efficient. Cost wise, energy wise and more broadly resource wise. 
And we know how difficult it is because the EU energy efficiency legislation has been subject to a record number of infringements, and it's the only target that has been difficult to achieve in the EU. And from my point of view, and I think from the Commission's point of view, it is this absolute necessity to be efficient in the decarbonization that is the, the, the real driver to the need to integrate the energy systems. I mean, in no entity or structure I know, it is efficient to work in silos. And, and the same holds true when it comes to decarbonate the energy system. We must strictly apply the well-known energy efficiency first principle. Um, we have to make an efficient use of all natural resources, respecting the circularity principle and the no, do, no, do no significant harm. Uh, principle and everywhere look for least cost solutions. And to me, that means, first of all, not to waste anything, which means reuse heat from industry or from data centers, exploit all the local bio waste, bio water resources to produce energy, and do not waste any heat in poorly insulated houses. Then it also means give priority to demand side solution, including smart charging, vehicle to grid, where it is cheaper than investing in new energy supply infrastructure, and factor in the life cycle energy use and footprint into all the decisions, both on the supply side, for example, in adequacy assessments, and on the demand side. It means privilege the direct use of cheap renewables, so electrify wherever possible. And I think that electrification is big, important stride in the, the uh, uh, system integration. We should electrify wherever possible, electric vehicles, heat pumps, electric furnaces, or other electricity-based processes in industry, and only where it is not technically feasible or where it is not cost efficient, use renewable and low carbon fuels. And, and there, then we have to exploit all the synergies between electricity and low carbon or green gas grids, uh, as well as with the end use sectors. And this is where hydrogen has, has a place to take. And this, result in a system which is more electrified, more decentralized, this system of systems that is multidirectional, most both vertically with active consumers and the injection of local production, also horizontally with exchanges between end users, which is more digitalized with flows of data which are multidirectional just the same way as the flows of energy. And it will link all the energy sources and uses, and that clearly will require a coordinated planning and operation of the system as a whole, as the definition of the Commission says, including not only between electricity and gas, but including heating, transport, and even communication grids. I mean, if we read well, the, the, as I remember, the 10 uh, regulation. So that's for policy. Now, what is at stake in the next, the coming few months and, and years is the adoption of the right regulatory framework, which is still missing to, gain, to, to reach this objective. And of course, I must give honor to where honor is due. And we'll start with the revision of the energy efficiency directive that not only will set a new target to be fit for 55, but it should foster circularity, a word which does not appear in the present text, and in particular, it, it should promote the use of waste heat, which is covered, but not really promoted, it's covered in a very weak way. Uh, and very important technical issue, it should review the primary energy factor and ensure that it is properly applied both in EU assessments and in member states assessments, so that the savings that are linked to the use of renewable electricity and heat can be better reflected in the end. And so we can make better choices. So then there is the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive also to be reviewed 
in terms of targets to be fit for 55, that will promote a renewable supply of electricity, but also electrification and renewables in transport and, uh, and uh, heating and cooling. And then even though market forces more and more deliver renewable investment, there are still a lot of barriers to be addressed uh, in the supply chain, in the insufficient smartness of the grid, in public acceptance, uh, in permitting procedures, etc. cetera. Uh, the existing uh, uh, renewable directive already foresees uh, guarantees of origin for renewable hydrogen. So we don't need uh, new, new provisions on there, it, but it contains, for example, rather weak rules on access to and operation of the grid for renewable gases, I think it's Article 20, and on district heating and cooling networks. So I suppose that will be reinforced in the new text. Uh, the revision should also propose a comprehensive terminology and a European certification system for all renewables, but also for low carbon fuels based on the, few, the full life cycle greenhouse gas emissions and I think on broader sustainability criteria than the ones we have now. Then we had the revision of the, the 10, uh, the 10 uh, regulation, and e regulation to replace a rather old regulation of 2013, again, to align it to the carbon neutrality objective and the energy efficiency first principle, which was not very much mentioned in the previous text. And this normally implies excluding any new fossil fuels infrastructures, including natural gas, as the, the European Investment Bank had already decided, and to propose new rules for smart integration between power and gas system, but also to exploit synergies with transport and communication networks and with industry. And then on the market side, I'm sure we will discuss that more later, uh, but I, will, I want to mention a few, I think, very important instruments that will promote efficiency and system integration by orienting investment flows towards the most efficient solution for decarbonization and, and also avoids uh, the waste of public money. First of all, there is the obviously the revision of the EU emission trading system is, is really key uh, with the proposal also for new instruments, uh, the, the famous carbon border adjustment mechanism. Again, the, the system must be made fit for 55 with a lower cap and, a, and an increased slope, something that I think market has have already anticipated because price is going up like above 55 euro. It will probably extend it to new sectors, aviation, maritime buildings, likely in separate systems, but with a link to help converge the convergence between the two systems. Now, in the present system, installation in sectors at risk of carbon leakage, such as uh, hydrogen production, by the way, they may receive free allowances. And in addition, they may also benefit from state aid to compensate for the indirect emissions cost. And that was confirmed in the last revision of the rules uh, in adopted in September. And surely this is, is a very costly way of, of doing things, of all these adjustments for carbon leakages and CBM would be a much more efficient system in terms of use of public resources. And then while I'm at public resources, there's the revision of the state aid rules. I think we've learned from the past mistakes in renewable support. So we already have new rules in the renewable energy directive. Uh, with new rules for aid schemes, but only for electricity for renewable electricity. So to ensure that producers respond to market signals and also that they maximize their market's revenues for going to the market. So they impose support in the form of a fixed or sliding market premium. Uh, they impose to take account of full system cost uh, and with some exceptions to be technologically neutral. And I think similar principles should be introduced for other renewable productions, not only for electricity, but for green hydrogen or, or, or uh, district heatings or other things. 
Now, the Commission is also revising the state aid rules for important projects of common interest, common in European interest, to avoid duplicates and gather all the competencies in EU-wide cooperation on projects that are deemed to be of European importance, like batteries and green hydrogen. Then, of course, we have to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, still about 50 billion euro in 2018. And actually, many of those fossil fuel subsidies stem from EU law itself, actually from the many tax exemptions and derogations that were needed to find unanimity in the, the directive, the 2003 directive on taxation of energy products. So that must be revised too, because it contains actually bias against electricity when we want more electrification. Uh, it should fix rates, I think, relating only to energy and, and greenhouse gas content, which is not the case now. It should avoid double taxation that sometimes bears both on inputs and on outputs, and of course, ensure a level playing field. And then finally, just to, to finish, there is the green finance, which to me is one of the most powerful instruments if you consider the amount of capital which is concerned. I mean, we now have new rules on non-financial -finance, disclosure. We have taxonomy regulations since last year. That fixes the methodology for sort of green lists to be defined by the European Commission. And the Commission has already adopted such a list last month with various uh, performance thresholds, for example, for the manufacturing of hydrogen and hydrogen based syn fuels, synthetic fuels, for low carbon vehicles, etc., in electricity generation from renewables, both on transmission, distribution, and storage and covering also low carbon uh, hydrogen and also on low carbon gases. And of course, we're waiting to see what the Commission will do with uh, natural gas and nuclear, which were the two controversial issues in this subject. So thank you very much. So lots of regulation, I think. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Anna, for nicely illustrating how sector integration will be achieved through a multitude of instruments, right? So yeah, there is yeah. some of some of it being achieved in each of these legislative files. So um, need to, that will need to be coherent. That will not yeah. be easy. I mean. Indeed, indeed. Um, thank you for giving us that overview. Toraj, I, I saw also your name mentioned on one of the last publications that Golnush referred to. So <laughs> I'm sure you will also be able to elaborate. Uh, what's your take on the topic? Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Yes, uh, and, and thanks to, uh, to, to Golnush for bringing this topic back on the map again because it, if you if you let it it will, it will disappear uh, be all the focus is on technology and the on the hardware at the moment so this is a welcome very welcome contribution and uh, and, and yes and we, we we have been uh, sort of working with Golnush uh, and, and and her colleagues uh, for, uh, for, for for a few years we have looked at uh, sort of the economics of uh, these uh, sort of uh, systems and also on the soft side, on the role of institutions and so on, that if I don't forget, I will, remain, I will go back to that uh, uh, near the end. Uh, so this is absolutely welcome, uh, and uh, and I very much like the sort of the, any anybody who tries to uh, as uh, Goldish didn't use the uh, the word today, but she did it. Uh, she used it last uh, last week uh, the, to conceptualize the energy system integration. I like that, and I and I think we need to do that, and we need we cannot do enough of it because we, what what we have done so far is not enough. I mean, we haven't uh, we've still been able to to define it and, and tackle uh, sort of this in in a sort of uh, to get a good feel of this. Uh, um, uh, there are just too many different definitions and interpretations of. The integrated systems at the moment. So this is absolutely a welcome um, contribution. Um, a few sort of scattered uh, sort of remarks on this process. Um, one is that the, the energy system integration it, it needs to it will it will have to fulfill two different roles. One is during the transition to take us from where we are we are to 2040 and 2050 and so on. So it will have to play develop and and they, and also I use the word I've learned from some of my colleagues the coevolution of the different systems. Coevolution is going to be very very hard. And, uh, and, and, and demanding, but it will need to be done. If you are going to have this, you cannot just integrate two systems and then 
and, 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 and then go home. These need to evolve at the same time parallel to each other in a coherent and, co and coordinated way. And that is a huge, huge challenge. So that's in the, in the, in the, during the process of uh, integration. And what, uh, the, uh, the, the transition to the decarbonized uh, sort of economy. And once you get there, then it will have to play a, sort of a different kind of role. And, they sort of, and in the, sort of, there will be new technologies and new sort of business models uh, arriving. Uh, then. So, uh, so it, has, uh, it has to fulfill two different uh, uh, roles at, uh, at, the same, at the same time. Um, I, I like to focus on uh, on the sort of dimension of uh, sort of modules. Or so I, I understand it a little bit sort of uh, better now. See a bit of a sort of contradiction. Therefore, you know, we, we talk about modules, but then while at the same time we are talking about systems and integrating systems or system of systems, right? Uh, uh, but uh, the, well, the components we shouldn't forget, of course. Uh, components are very important. Some components are more important maybe than the others, and maybe some of them are actually key in making uh, the integration process sort of, uh, to actually take place. Um, so um, any contributions from institutional economics in that form, uh, absolutely welcome. There are other areas that economists should step in and, uh, and, um, and explore in terms of bringing sort of new ways of uh, sort of conceptualization of this uh, phenomena. And, um, um, so, uh, so, 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 some examples of it would, would be uh, would be would be nice to have, so that we can actually focus on on some of these. Sort of, uh, uh, so we can help um, people so to imagine what these sort of modules are, and uh, I suppose power to X is a, is an is, a, is an obvious one of them. So. Um, but um, the, um, as um, as was mentioned in the first presentation, the, uh, the much of the focus, as we have noticed, is on the technological and technical uh, uh, aspects of uh, system integration. That is not enough. It's a good beginning. It's a good start, but that is not absolutely uh, enough. We, 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 we were working last week on a, on a roadmap towards implementation of um, power to x uh, uh, technologies by uh, by 2030, for, uh, for for example. So so we had a roadmap at, at the end of a lot of con good contributions from colleagues and so on. But I had one question at the end of it. So we have a roadmap, but where is the road? Uh, we, so we have all these ideas that we do this first, and then we do that second, and then third, and so on. But where do we start? And then so th that road is sort of it requires uh, all those things that many colleagues are increasingly identifying. The, the, the policy, the regulation, business models, without those, I mean, those, that's the road, essentially. So uh, at the moment, we have a map, but we are looking for a road that fits that map, right? Uh, so um, so there is a whole lo a lot of work in, um, uh, still uh, ahead of us. And it, uh, and it was mentioned that whether technology is more important than policy and regulation or versus uh, sort of business models and, uh, and and um, uh, all of them, to me, it's like, it's, it's, it's like an onion. Uh, um, all parts of it are equally sort of important. But I, I, sort of, I, I conceptualize this sometimes, you know, as that uh, I put the assets and the technology and the hardware at the bottom, and then there is a layer uh, over it that is the policy and, and regulation. And then there is another layer that comes on top of it, and that is the sort of the business models and, uh, and, and, and commercialization and digitalization and all those uh, things. That, so at the end of the day, that is where they sort of, um, so you, you can have an infrastructure, but how do you capture the value? The, capturing the value is going to do, be the most important thing. I mean, sort of, uh, we are talking about hundreds of billions of uh, sort of in, in investments. Uh, if we decide we can have an integrated system that is physically integrated, but if we are not careful, we can, if we, and if you use it in an in a, in a inefficient way, it can, it, it can actually be uh, harmful. It, it needs to work in an efficient way as, as Anna also uh, mentioned. Just connecting everything to everything is not enough. It has to be level playing field between different energy vectors and energy sectors and, um, and, and, and uh, energy sources. Uh, so this infrastructure will need to be used in an efficient way. Uh, so, so, so that is, uh, that is going to be very sort of, um, important going forward. So all three aspects are very important, but regulation and policy are at the heart of it. I mean, so they could, because they work backward and forward between the business model and, bit, and, and, the, and the technology and the, and, 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 and the, and the roadmap. 
so efficient user. Uh, uh, one thing that is uh, not uh, emphasized um, sufficiently is the demand. The, 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 so uh, we, we are, um, in many occasions, when we talk about uh, energy system integration, we have, you know, for example, hydrogen in mind and so on. Uh, that hydrogen, it needs to demand. That demand is uh, is not developed yet. It will have to come from somewhere. That is sort of, we, it's, we, we should pay more attention to the issue of the, so the, the, mar, uh, the, mar, uh, the, the market pool, uh, rather than just focusing on the technology uh, push here. So, so, that, uh, so I, um, I like to emphasize that very much. And also for going forward, there, there, will, there, there are two other things that we uh, sort of, uh, I, I still find them sort of absent from uh, many of our discussions. One is about the, uh, when we talk about energy system integration, most of the time we talk and imagine um, TSO level kind of uh, upstream uh, sort of integration and so on. What if it starts from the DNO level and DSO level? I mean, if you look, if you look back at the history of development of town gas in the 1800s in uh, various places sort of in, in Europe and so on, um, these things can start from somewhere unexpected uh, where, where the, if there is an unmet demand and there is a, and, and, and the local conditions are right, that can, that can happen. So, they, so we should not forget the distribution level integration. And we, 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 we had a good example of, of it a few years ago in, in, in the UK where the, our local gas distribution and electricity distribution companies, they came together, they started comparing map of their assets and where they can integrate it and so on. And they were very serious about it. But we don't hear about those examples and, ex and experiments very much. And then uh, the other thing uh, that sort of uh, comes to mind is that we, we, we should remember and recall that, men, that much of the uh, integrated system is going to be regulated, natural monopolies. We are talking about networks. Networks are regulated. They don't do anything unless they are incentivized. And um, so the, in the, the decisions that are made there, again, you know, the, all those billions that are going to be sort of in, invested there, it has to be efficient. And uh, so re regulators have a lot of work to do in, the, in, in, in that space. So another debate that is sort of is required is the role of state in the future energy systems, you know, with the offshore wind resources and the, um, and the sort of the implementation of a new, for example, a new hydrogen system. It's not more than, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more than just putting a new uh, sort of kit in, in, in place. It's a whole system. It has the demand and the network and the and supply side and, and so on. Um, uh, historically, traditionally, the state has had an important role in implementation and making these sort of systems a reality. They don't have the, it's, 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 if, if you have hundred years to wait, yes, it can, it can probably happen. But if you're in a rush, we, we need a sort of new, a, a, a new way of sort of looking at it. The institutions and the way and the working models that we have had may, may need to be revisited somewhere along the way. They may not be good enough quite for taking us uh, there. And then uh, I fall back at the end in my final comment on the experience we have had with the following uh, sort of the, the beginning of the liberalization of energy sectors from 1990 um, in, from, in, from the UK and, and Norway uh, and, and so on. And one of the things that we learned that at the beginning, uh, all the countries looked at it and they look at the reform model or these implementation models and say, oh, that's very simple. I can do it. And everybody tried, but a lot of them failed. Uh, and that comes back to what I mentioned that you know, we, we were looking at with, with Golnish some years ago, the quality of uh, governance, the competence of the governments, uh, 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 the, the quality of the institutions in implementing such complicated systems. These are very going, going, going to be very, very complicated systems. And there is no way we can keep tradition and institution and, and, and culture and, and, and consumption and production habits uh, 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 out of it. It's, so they are going to be very important. Some, uh, so I, my prediction is that in the midterm, some countries will succeed, but some will also fail because these things are very difficult to say, judging by the experiment, ex experience of uh, power sector reforms and energy reforms in, uh, globally. Uh, I, yes. I think thank, I, uh, yeah. Thank I, you, Taraj. I think what you just said nicely connects with some of the questions. So let me um, immediately uh, use that to, to follow up with you and Anne. So we have, first of all, Ilaria that makes that point. Should our governance, our institutions evolve? Uh, to what extent are NRAs and TSOs 
um, you know, that cover more sectors, maybe better able um, to handle these new uh, sector integration challenges or, or system integration challenges. And then very complimentary question uh, by Hassan Ali, who says, and what about third countries? Uh, because it's all nice to talk about it at EU level, but we are connected to third countries. So will they somehow be involved in that integration or will we have two levels of integration? Now? So I'll just give you the opportunity to react to both questions or one as you prefer. The ones that is closest yeah. to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we start with Anna and then we go back to Toraj. Yeah, on mute, uh, Anna. I mean, that there is a link with, with a uh, neighboring system is clear because we will be importing uh, hydrogen, for example. And, and in the, 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 as I remember, when we prepare the, the uh, trans-European networks, the, the connection with third countries belongs to the, the planning in the trans-European networks. So it's not that we have a completely disconnected system and we will have to agree, like we already have the renewable directive, we will have to agree, for example, on guarantees of origin to have bilateral agreements with third countries. But I don't see a sort of common governance, otherwise it has, has no end. So there is a governance at EU level. But there are also interesting questions in the, the conversation uh, uh, thing, where uh, there is a question about, about enforcement of the existing regulation, which obviously is, is, is absolutely key. But this being said, there is at EU level, there is an automatic check on, on transposition of directive, and that is always automatic. Immediately after the adoption of the directive, the Commission verifies uh, that transposition takes place at the right play, pace. But then once it's transposed in national law, the practical enforcement is for national authorities. And same way for regulation, one uh, EU regulation is also immediately a national regulation. So it's national authorities that actually do the practical enforcement. And what the commission does uh, is check that the authorities in the member states, it's regulator, who are in charge of, of controlling, do their job and have enough resources, etc. Then there's a question about, about the integration about, of small system and, and European system. But I think we need both. I mean, the whole point is that we need more decentralization and more connections at EU level because we will need sort of cheaper solar a uh, resource from the sort of, of Europe uh, for the north and, uh, and wind resources usually at what a different moment. So we will need this, this European backbone to lower the cost of the system. So we, we will really need both. It's not a choice between, between the two. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for also reacting to the chat in addition to the questions I was reading out from the Q and A box. Go ahead, Toraj. Um, my, my my reply is is is, is short. I, I I I agree with Anna, uh, and I, I think in in order to make all these sort of new new um, and useful uh, sort of, uh, connections, one keyword here is probably uh, standardization. Standardization both in in technical terms, in terms of the equipment and for for digitalization. And, and for exchange of data and uh, and uh, on ownership of it and so on the use of it in, so that business models can develop across uh, uh, across the borders so that you know if you have if you're one company you don't have to deal with 27 different kind of legislations and 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 getting access to to, to networks and so on that that is on the on the technical side but also regulators uh, they they can take advantage of the of the in integration and 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 probably get done some of the things that they are not able to handle themselves in a one-to-one -one basis with their with, with their um, with their own uh, sort of, uh, TSOs and so on, but maybe collectively at the at the, the, Euro, at the with the European platform, they can uh, they can they, they can achieve more. 
Uh, but again, uh, w- there will be other kind of uh, challenges. For example, we don't, uh, for example, the, the um, EU is not very active on in terms of passing judgment on the ownership aspect of the energy sectors, but we will see increasingly state owned, for example, uh, utilities investing in other countries, going into new kind of businesses, uh, going into each other's country, countries, uh, and, and, and so on, uh, or they go beyond their own borders. And so on. there will be some of these kind of issues that will, uh, that uh, so far we have managed to, to progress despite with, with, given these constraints and so on. Uh, but going forward, we, we may need to sort of face uh, some some of these uh, sort of issues because they are uh, they, they 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 are complicating the system so in order to to draw the line between regulation and market and uh, and between the state and the uh, and the, and the private uh, sphere. Thank you, Toraj. Um, I see two more questions, and they nicely connect with the questions I also wanted to ask you. So let me just uh, show you a few uh, news items. Uh, Yesterday on Twitter, I could read um, the latest development is that our commissioner, uh, Ms. Simpson, has yesterday in the European Parliament presented this uh, energy system integration strategy. Uh, So I was not there in the parliament. I do not know to what extent it was a heated debate, but Anna, maybe you can tell us uh, what's your view and and if you think something is still missing in this strategy or not. uh. But I mean, as as Tura said, I mean, and actually God knows too, uh, a lot of the literature and a lot of what we see now is about technologies and infrastructures. And we can trust the commission to put rules, you know, to have regulation and governance. What personally I think is missing is is what we concretely will do about households, citizens and the residential sector. Uh, Because because we will really need their participation in the system. And what I see now is, first of all, there's this sort of well-known disconnect between the intellectual adhesion to ambitious climate objectives, et cetera, and what people are really ready to do in practice. I mean, the vast majority of people, they're ready to sort out their waste, but I mean, ask them to give up their car, both. uh, And then, you know, they they agree that we need infrastructures, but not in my backyard. Mm. So, I mean, those are, are really real obstacles Second, we will need massive consumer participation, demand response. And besides the fact that the vast majority of people have no idea of what that means, we don't have yet, at least in the countries I know, attractive services that are there on the markets for consumers to really be active consumers. And if there is no service, I suppose it's because there's no business case. And uh, if there's no business case, probably it is because the present framework is not sufficient. Uh, I think smart meters are not smart enough, besides the fact that they are not deployed in all member states. Uh, I think it's also linked, I mean, the right to be offered a dynamic electricity price contract cannot produce effects if people are not equipped and and they don't have the services. So there's something missing there. And then to me, there's a problem of access to data. If we want to have a business case, we need uh, startups to have easy access to real-time data so that they can can build those services. Uh, Now, now I understand that there will be a delegated act or an implementing act on interoperability and access to transparent data, et cetera, and guidelines or network code. So maybe that will solve the problem, but I don't see it satisfactory as it is now. And then I think the third thing I would mention about citizens is that it could take much longer than desirable to see people sort of investing in better insulation, replacing their gas boilers to, you know, heat pumps and, you know, electrify their transport means uh, with electric vehicles. Uh, There are a lot of barriers in terms of the capital you need to invest, you know, upfront. 
So I think these are, are real uh, uh, obstacles that will not be solved at EU level except for some regulatory aspects. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot more to be done in terms of communication at local level uh, also. Thank you, Anna. Then for Turaj, I, I cannot help it as a director of a school of infrastructure. I have to uh, ask you, Turaj, what you think about another very recent communication, in this case by Acer, right? Acer seems to have been scrutinizing the latest NSUEs uh, and NSOG 10YNDP, and you also have the discussion on uh, the 10E regulation. So, uh, Turaj, what's your take on that uh, from a system integration point of view? Uh, well, thank you, Leo. Uh, <laughs> a very, very simple question, I think. Uh, um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I like to be brief, and, and, and probably I, I hope I, I hit the target uh, sort of in a, in a way by, by referring to this vehicle that drives both 10E and, uh, and 10YNDP, or it's a sort of, a, a, sort of an assumption. Uh, so that uh, for for achieving the uh, energy system integration, and that is, I, I would like to bring to focus. It won't be new to you, Leo, but uh, the the uh, our, uh, the research and development and innovation policy. We are talking about 2050 and so on. But how are we getting there? We are getting there by two-year projects here, three-year projects there, five-year. It's so fragmented. Uh, we don't have the institutions that have the, uh, the that, that 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 know. They, they will be there in some research institutions, in, 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 in R&D institutions. We don't even uh, we, we we don't have good enough systems for uh, for um, communicating the research that is being done. One hand doesn't know much about the other, and so on. We don't do enough about pre preserving uh, the research that be, that is being done. Uh, R&D is very expensive. It's extremely expensive. So it's very wasteful if we go uh, sort of a, a piecemeal sort of approach. I mean, you don't go from here to the moon 10 miles at a time. I mean, you probably need to go at least 10,000 miles at a time uh, in, in order to get there. Uh, and, uh, and we need to sort of look at the sort of, we, we are trying to get to 2050 in a way with some modifications to the way we have always been, uh, been, 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 been working. While what's at, at stake is hundreds of billions of euros of, uh, of, of in investment. But uh, I, um, well, you, you know better. You know, we, we we always say that energy industry is one of the least R and D intensive industries as it is. Mm -hmm. So if we if we see between now and then, you know, if we get a sort of if we make a back of the envelope calculation of how much research and development, not only the technology but the socioeconomic aspect and other related, even. The research that is being done in in, in, in the commission and, and, and in, the, in the sort of research outfits like yours and mine, uh, and so on, it's uh, the, it's a very very small fraction of it. So we it is it is possible we get to the, in, the future integrated systems, but it may not be the the most effective one, or it may not be the one the best one that we could have had. Uh, so, uh, so I, I essentially sum up uh, by, by, by saying that we need to revisit our innovation strategy that will take us to 2050 or will be alongside of the sort of energy system in integration. It will evolve and it will develop alongside of it. The way we are going about it, a little bit of projects here and there and so on. And the budgets are big, but the way the research being done is fragmented. I don't think it's sufficient. Thank you, Turash. Couldn't agree more. Um, Golnush, I hope we helped you. You kicked off the event, and I guess I should also ask you to close the event. Maybe tell us a bit more on what you will do next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Definitely, it was a great help, and it is always a pleasure to have both Turash and Anne with us. And I can always learn, of course. Uh, yeah, I understood. Uh, uh, but yeah, of course, from uh, the comments by both and, and Turaj, you see that uh, energy system integration is more complex than before. So as I mentioned before, technology is only one uh, part of it. It's not a small part, but it's only one part of it. And then uh, it, it becomes more, even more complex uh, when we go to EU decisions and policy making and regulation and all the coordination that is needed uh, at all levels. 
And uh, uh, for me, it is only the start. <laughs> I, I know that I have a lot to do. But thank you. Thank you to both. <laughs> And you have our full blessing, as Toraj said it, to continue to conceptualize energy yes. system integration, right? <laughs> true, and you can true. use vectors, modules, you can, you can make uh, <laughs> your own uh, version of that. True. <laughs> also, on my behalf, Toraj, Anna, really thank you. Um, and I let me just finish by reminding everyone that if you would like to join any of our upcoming events, Here's a quick overview, depending on, you know, your interests. Maybe you want to connect with us on dynamic pricing uh, in May, or you can also come to a more legal discussion we will have on the Opal case. Um, or if innovation is what really drives you, there is another um, event for you there. So as you know, you can always just register and at some point, I'm sure we will see you back. And I'm pretty sure that this is also not the last time we have invited Toraj, Anna, and Golnush. So <laughs> bye for now, but see you soon. Thank you. Ciao.